Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, recording this from my home uh, as I am trying to fight off this really unpleasant uh, infection that I have. So if my voice or mannerisms are not up to my, my usual standards, I hope you will forgive me. The purpose of this lecture is to tell the, the story, uh, the, the basic chronological story of... of France and what happens to France uh, between the Congress of Vienna and the revolutions of 1848. It's a, it's a complicated story. It's, a, it's, a fa it's the French, of course. It's a fascinating story, uh, endlessly entertaining, uh, filled with wonderful characters and uh, glorious, heroic, futile gestures and doomed, tragic gestures and, and, and really a, 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 a marvelous story. So marvelous, in fact, that they made a, a, a book and a show and a movie about part, just part of it, uh, which we'll get to in a little bit. Um, so so um, let, let's do a little context. Um, you remember, we're, we're basically looking at here the first half of the 19th century. We're dealing with the fallout from the French Revolution, the ideological fallout, the the emotional fallout, the political fallout, the military fallout, all of these things are, are, are going to profoundly shape Europe in the first half of the, uh, of the 19th century. Um, and 1848 is, is often seen as the great turning point, the great, the great point, ah, you know, at, at 1848, this is where things change. Although uh, a famous historian named uh, Trevelyan uh, once wittily replied that 1848 is the turning point at which history failed to turn. Um, so, so we can we'll discuss that later. Whether 1848 was in fact a turning point. Um, what we're going to see today, as we go through France, is a, a, a whole bunch of our friends, the isms. Uh, we'll see some of nationalism. We will see romanticism for certain. We will see socialism stepping up in a big way for the first time. We'll see conservatism hanging on desperately. We'll see liberalism trying to pick a side and ultimately picking a side in a very decisive and bloody way. Uh, and, um, and so all, most of these isms that we've been ex exploring are going to appear during this run. So keep an eye out for, for each of those. All right, so we have to start this by looking at the Congress of Vienna. Was it a success? Was it a failure? Um, <coughs> and, and really, I guess it depends your answer to that question depends on, on what you think the purpose of, of the Congress was. Um, on the one hand, uh, many people at the time and since have criticized the Congress uh, because it, it really ignored liberalism, it ignored nationalism. The Congress is a very conservative institution. It is about rolling back the clock as best they can and not encouraging liberalism or nationalism. Um, and, and, you know, since, since we know what comes next, that looks uh, like a very reactionary retrograde position. And if you are a liberal or a nationalist, it, that's something you can, you can fairly criticize uh, the Congress for. Um, I think it's also a fair criticism to say that, that the, the, the leading members uh, at, at Vienna and by this, of, of course, uh, we mean Talleyrand and all of the others, probably underestimated just how explosive and dangerous nationalism and liberalism were. I mean, they knew they were bad. They knew the French Revolution had scared the snot out of them. They knew it was something that they wanted desperately to control. But they thought they could control it. And since, in, in retrospect, we, we can sort of say, well, they failed... Maybe we can we can fairly criticize them for for not understanding the direction the wind was blowing. I, I don't know if that's a fair criticism. Can you really expect a, um, a, a statesman to, to 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 perceive the future or major changes? Um, but uh, it, it, it's it's it is a, it is a, a a common criticism of the Congress. On the other hand, the Congress succeeded 
in what I think most of its participants would have said was the most important thing, which is they kept the peace and they established a balance of power. Um, you know, basically from 1815 to 1870, we're going to see the same states running things in Europe the, and in, in roughly the same uh, proportions. Um, you know, there'll be maneuvering and little gains and little losses, but basically it's going to be the big five. Britain, France, Austria, Prussia, Russia. Those are going to be the players, and the balance of power between them is going to stay pretty, pretty well set. And critically, there's not going to be a general war, right? I, I mean, think about the 18th century. Think about the 17th century. Think about all those horrific wars that dragged on for years and years and years and all the lives and all the damage. The 19th century, if you start the 19th century at 1815, is, is the most peaceful century of European history. Um, no, obviously, <laughs> excluding those first 15 years is a doozy. Uh, but the point is, Vienna did avert a general war. By general war, I mean a war in which uh, most of the great powers uh, throw down against each other. There are going to be some, some conflicts. There's going to be a Crimean War uh, you know, uh, between some of the powers, but it's never going to get out of hand. It's never going to become a really big, horrible, knockdown drag out like the Thirty Years' War, like the Seven Years' War, like the French Revolutionary Wars, like the Napoleonic Wars. We don't have anything like that after 1815. Um, so, so how did they accomplish this? Well, they basically agreed to the principle of collective security. They, they all agreed that the wars were terrible, that it was not in any of their interest to have them anymore, um, and, and that they would work together to try and maintain the peace. Um, and so their goal is to define the status quo. That was what the Congress of Vienna was about, so defining it, where are the borders, who's where, and then to monitor it and step in where necessary to maintain that status quo. So the intervention in Napoli, the Carlsbad decrees, the crushing of the revolts in, uh, in Russia, all these things that sort of contribute to maintaining that status quo. Uh, remember, uh, you'll, you'll see in, this, in the map, um, the new shape of Prussia, still discontinuous, still a very odd shape in that dark green there, but notice how Prussia is now bordering directly on France. That was part of keeping an, a watchdog, right? The sentinel on the Rhine. So the Prussians could keep an eye on the French um, and, and, and stop them from having uh, too ambitious uh, uh, plans or to get any, any uh, crazy ideas. So, so this is what Europe looks like as we move through the, the first half of the 19th century. And it's, it's worth remembering just how important France is. Um, yes, France has been defeated. Yes, Napoleon is finally gone. Um, yes, France was, was uh, victimized to some extent at the Second Congress of Vienna after Waterloo. But France is still the center of Europe. It's the center culturally, it's the center geographically, uh, or at least the center of Western Europe, um, it, has, it has tremendous influence. Um, and it's, it's probably not obvious yet that Great Britain has completely surpassed it. Um, remember, Great Britain only defeats France in the Revolutionary Wars because all of the rest of Europe is on, France, is, is on England's side. If Great Britain had fought France straight up, I don't know. So, um, so, so, so you get this, this, this famous cartoon, right, um, uh, from 1848, where you have all of the, the monarchs of Europe at sea in this little boat, and it's all storm-tossed, and there's this giant sea monster um, who is menacing them and, and kicking up waves, and notice the French sea monster is wearing the red cap of the sans uh, the fear of revolutionism. Um, and the, there was the famous phrase, when France sneezes, Europe catches cold. So there was this sense that if something goes wrong in France, it's going to be bad for all of us. <laughs> and something's going to go wrong in France. Spoiler alert. Okay, so, so now let's, let's go to the chronology. Let's, let's begin working through some rulers. Uh, we begin with this guy. 
King Louis XVIII of France. You remember Louis? He is the kid brother of Louis XVI. You remember that he's Louis XVIII because poor Louis XVII was Louis XVI's son, the poor kid who dies in prison alone, sad, abandoned during the revolution. Um, so Louis XVIII um, becomes the restored Bourbon monarch after Napoleon is defeated. The, the, the powers of Europe, the Congress of Vienna, decides that the best thing to do is to put a, the French royal house back in France. That's the best way to control the French and to keep them from getting these crazy revolutionary or imperial ideas. So Louis XVIII takes over. He's a very mediocre man. Um, he's he's uh, rather fat. Uh, he's not particularly bright. He's not particularly energetic. Um, as you can see, he has a fabulous portrait uh, with some, some wonderful furs and stuff, but really uh, not, not an inspiring leader. Uh, he's the one who, when Napoleon comes back, immediately bugs out and abandons his own country, lets Napoleon take over again, then comes back after the British beat him at Waterloo. Um, and so, so Louis XVIII um, uh, rules as a pseudo-constitutional monarch. Um, <coughs> there is a, a what's called the Constitutional Charter of 1814, which creates a, a French constitutional monarchy, and it's basically liberal. There are some economic and social protections. Um, you know, a lot of the things that the bourgeois wanted to get out of the French Revolution, the Constitution provides. Um, but, and this is very important, the, the franchise, the vote, is very, very limited. Basically, only rich guys get to vote. So, it's, it's a half-baked compromise, uh, the, 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 you know, the, France under, under Louis XVIII. Um, it's not especially prosperous. Um, it's, it's getting over the tremendous damages uh, of, of, of the revolution and of the Napoleonic Wars. And it's important to remember, France is very, very divided. Um, and, and there is this conservative backlash. Um, the, 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 um, uh, while there are still plenty of people who remember the revolution fondly or remember Napoleon fondly, um, there are also a lot of conservatives. There's a lot of monarchists, people who are in exile for years and years who come back when Napoleon is finally defeated. Oh, thank God, the king is back, the Bourbons are back. It's time for some payback. Um, and so the Count Artois, who is the king's younger brother, becomes the leader of this ultra-royalist group. And they go looking for some revenge. And they launch what will be called the White Terror. You know, we think of the, the, the terror of Robespierre in 1794 as sort of a red terror, right? Red with a sad culotte. Well, white is the color of the Bourbon. And here we have a bunch of uh, young, tough aristocrats uh, led by this, by this prince who go around beating people up um, and stealing their stuff and burning their houses and, and looking to get revenge for all of the many bad things that were done to them or perceived to be done to them. Uh, over the last, really, 25 years. There's a lot of bitterness. There's a lot of, uh, there's a, there's a lot of pent-up animosity, and, and Louis XVIII is not the man to inspire the country to come together. Um, and, and so he kind of putzes along, the country stumbles along, divided um, and uh, intermittently violent. Louis dies. Uh, and is succeeded uh, then by his kid brother, Charles X. Yes, the Count of Artois, the same guy who was leading these, uh, these, these, these violent uh, uh, bully groups of thugs. Now he's the king. <laughs> this has to end well, right? Um, so he, he's the king uh, throughout most of the 1820s, um, uh, and he's uh, more conservative uh, than his brother, um, and while I wouldn't call him a great man, at least he has some ideas. Those ideas are reactionary. Uh, but he gradually pushes the country in a more conservative direction. And finally, in 1830, he gets sick of the constitutional charter. People keep telling him, oh, well, you can't do that. You know, France is a constitutional monarchy. There are limits on your authority. And finally, Charles says, shut up. 
um, I am a divine right monarch, and he tries to reimpose the Ancien Regime to go all the way back to the 18th century, and he dissolves the entire Parlement, um, and, and he is going to uh, uh, roll France back to the good old days. This, this leads to the first of the great 18th century uh, French moments, to the barricades! Um, this is the famous painting, which I'm sure you've seen before. It's called Liberty Leading the People, uh, painted by Delacroix. Delacroix, who was probably the illegitimate son of Talleyrand, because why not? Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's a super romantic painting, right? Uh, uh, Delacroix had put himself in the painting. He's the guy uh, with the top hat and the, and the gun right behind the uh, topless woman, Marianne, who was carrying the three color. So the idea is, that this is painted after the fact, uh, but to glorify the, the revolution of 1830. This is called the July Revolution. And the July Revolution of 1830 is known as the Three Glorious Days. This is what Les Miserables is about. Please don't make the mistake of saying Les Miserables is about 1848. It's not. Les Mis is about 1830. Um, and, and so this is where the people of Paris, and it's mostly Paris, take to the streets um, and, and bar literally barricade the streets, the avenues of, of Paris. Um, they shut the city down. They go into open revolt. And you, you just to understand, Paris is at this point a very old-fashioned city. It's still got a lot of medieval buildings, medieval architecture, which means the streets are very narrow, which means it's really easy to put up a few barricades and just cut the city apart in pieces. So the government can't move its troops from one side to the other. People can't communicate. They don't know what's going on. Um, and so the people um, organize this, this, this spontaneous uprising. Um, and, and they win, right? I mean, lame is, yay, the people win. Can you hear the people singing and all that, all that great stuff? So the people triumph. Um, and, and Charles um, has, to, has to back down. And in fact, he's driven from power. Um, <coughs> um, he is replaced by Louis Philippe, who is a cousin of the Bourbon family. Charles X slinks out of, out of France. Um, and Louis Philippe uh, basically tries to calm things down. He, he reinstates the constitutional charter, goes back to the government the way it was uh, under Louis XVIII. Um, and so the middle class does okay. The middle class goes back and gets the kind of liberal guarantees of civil liberties and property that they care about. So, so 1830 is a victory for the middle class. But the people pretty much get nothing. And you remember this division within French society and within the motivations of the French revolutionaries goes all the way back to 1789, right? What are we revolting for? Are we revolting for the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen, for the Enlightenment, for all that good stuff? Or are we revolting because we're starving? Because this is a rigged game. Because you're rich and I'm not, and that's not right. Of course, the answer depends on who you ask. The middle class are, 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 are looking for their liberal rights, which they basically get under Louis Philippe. The people get nothing. So there's this sense of the people were sort of betrayed in 1830. You know, they were the ones who did the fighting and the dying on the, on the barricades, but ultimately they're sold out. So stay tuned. Um, Louis Philippe, now takes over. And, and just notice the difference between his portraits and the portraits of, of Charles X or Louis XVIII, right? He, he, he portrayed himself as the citizen king. Notice there isn't even a crown in this portrait. Uh, he presents himself as a, as a soldier, as a general. Um, uh, uh, you're not a, not a particularly uh, impressive uh, guy. Um, even in his own portraits, he was, he was paunchy, um, sort of unimpressive fellow um, and, and um, really won the respect of, of almost nobody. Uh, here's a famous cartoon um, where uh, his nickname is described as The Pear. Now, nobody is going to be afraid of you if your nickname is The Pear. Um, so so there's, you know, there's this sense, again, of France kind of staggering along under this constitutional monarchy, but maybe nobody is really satisfied with it. Um, so, so Louis is trying to keep the lid on things, trying to keep control, trying to 
limit the the demands and the power of um, the 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 people. And and there are demands. Um, and this leads us to February of eighteen forty eight, um, where where the heavy handedness of Louis is becoming worse and worse. Um, Louis's pre first minister is this guy, um, Francois Guizot. It, it, just take a look at the picture, right? I mean, anytime you paint yourself looking like this, standing in front of marble, on top of marble, with your skin basically just looking like translucent marble, you're not going for a, a kind and fuzzy look, right? I mean, this guy wants you to look at him and think, scary. Um, which he was. Guizot was F Louis Philippe's guy to crack down on the people and to cut back on their rights and, and, and reduce the complaining and the protesting. Um, people began to um, uh, fight against government censorship in the form of banquets. You know, the, the, the government would, would censor the press and would cut down on uh, uh, the rights of assembly. But the Parisians had this habit of banquets, right? Um, uh, I mean, they're Parisians. They're, they love nothing more than food. So they would get together for these wonderful banquets where all this food would be served. And then, of course, wine would be drunk. And if wine is drunk, there's going to be toast. And so people would get up to give toast, and the toast would turn into political speeches. And, and so <coughs> this became a mechanism for political protest. Well, Guizot, in his ham-handed fashion, uh, decides to ban the banquets. Now look. You can do a lot of things to Parisians. You can shoot them, you can attack them, you can censor them, you can put them in jail, you can guillotine them. They'll put up with a lot, right? But if you tell a Parisian he can't go to dinner, well, I mean, it is all on. And so uh, uh, the Parisians uh, uh, protest against the, uh, the shutting down of their beloved banquets, uh, and the government troops open fire on these peaceful protesters who are just trying to have their God-given rights as Frenchmen to eat good food. And so, to the barricades, again. Um, so this is February 1848. Uh, the people rise up, and this time they're gunning for Louis Philippe, the citizen king. The leader of this group is Alphonse Lamartin. Uh, Lamartin is a really interesting guy. He is a poet, and he's a really good poet. He's a famous poet. I mean, he's like... Uh, a romantic poet who wrote some, some historically great French verse. One of the most popular poets in, in all of France. Um, I, I'm, I've been trying to come up with, a, with a, an appropriate comparison. I, I don't know what it would be. I, I, I mean, he's, I, I don't know, like a, 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 some kind of cross between Jay-Z and Adele uh, in the sense that he was a celebrity and he was uh, uh, you know, making verse and very famous, um, but not as, as sort of dangerous, perhaps, as the implied Jay-Z thing. So there's this, there's this Adele, we can all just get along and be nice romanticism thing going on uh, with, with, with Lamartine. Um, he's ultimately a liberal. Lamartine believes in people being nice to each other. He believes in, in basic goodness. He believes in the rights of man, and he believes that the people of France can work it out, get along, and do the Enlightenment thing. Um, so Lamartine uh, declares a new provisional government. Louis Philippe is driven away. Uh, the, 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 the Bourbon monarchs are driven away finally for the final time. Um, and, and there's a, a provisional government that, that Lamartine says, okay, we're the government, but only until we can have elections. Now, Lamartine being the nice guy that he is, basically thinks there should be universal suffrage, right? The government, the provisional government is only here until we can have elections, and then the new government will decide the new constitution. Uh, and he thinks that everybody should vote. But conservatives and bourgeois liberals are very suspicious of this kind of republicanism. What do you mean we're going to let everybody vote? Including those people? The ones on the barricades? That's a bad idea. Even worse, as part of the provisional government, we get socialists. This is our first socialist of the course, Louis Blanc. Um, he's a social democrat. And uh, Blanc has this, 
semi-practical, semi-crazy idea called national workshops. France is going through tremendous economic trauma right now. Um, as always, revolution starts in part because the uh, people are suffering. And so a, a Blanc wants to help the people. He's actually a politician who's committed to helping the common people in their suffering. And his plan is national workshops, basically national factories. If you don't have a job, you can come to a national workshop and you will be given employment. You will build something. You will make something, a, a, a tool, a, a toy, a piece of clothing, something. You will do something um, because there is dignity in work. Um, and, and that will give the people something to do and keep them out of the streets and they will earn some small amount of money so they can avoid starving and the government will, you know, maybe the government's not going to make a ton of money on these products, but the government can sell them to make some kind of money uh, and, and, um, and, and this way the government can help the people in their suffering. Um, Blanc thinks this is a great idea. The socialists think this is a great idea. Many of the common people, the working people of France, uh, Paris at least, think this is a fabulous idea. Um, however, the liberals hate this. The liberals see this as a huge, huge problem. It's an attack on liberal economic principles. Um, and so the liberals, in a very sneaky fashion, maneuver to... Uh, uh, cause the workshops to fail. The, 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 the liberals are just trying to buy time. You know, the people are on the streets, there's barricades, there's violence. Let's just get the people cooled down. Tell them, yeah, sure, Louis, yeah, whatever. Tell them about the workshops. Yeah, fine, Send, let them even go and do some stuff. Whatever, just get them calmed down. But, but they don't fund them. There's no money in the government budget to pay the people for their work. And so people are showing up at these workshops and they're doing the work and they're not getting paid or they're getting paid just pittances. And so the workshops are seen as failures and to some extent failures of the socialists, although they fail because the liberals set them up to fail. So now we're moving through 1848, right? I mean, remember the, the revolution uh, that drove out Louis Philippe is in, is in February. Now we're moving through m March to May. <coughs> remember that the Louis is driven out by a coalition, the classic French Revolutionary Coalition of the bourgeois liberals and the working class Parisians, right? We've seen this coalition so many times before, right? 1789, 1791, this, so the saint and the Jacobins, we have seen this, this thing before. Well, that coalition is going to split as we move into the spring of 1848. Um, and the conflicts are over several things. Really, they don't want the same things. That's the problem. Um, the socialists want there to be government social programs, like the workshops, to take care of the common people. The liberals don't want to pay for it. I, why should I pay taxes to support those lazy, uh, 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 scummy, violent Parisians? Um, and also ideology. The liberals are committed to uh, the ideas of laissez-faire, of private property. Remember, remember the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen says that property is sacred. Um, so, so this idea that you would be taxed to support somebody else goes straight against that sort of ideology, that sort of self-interest. Um, there's also social tensions between the working class and the bourgeois, which is you know, basically a tension between the employers and the employees, right? I mean, the, the bourgeois, the guys, for the most part, who own businesses and factories and the, and the uh, working class, the people who are employed. So we want different things, right? I'm the bourgeois. I want to pay you less, right? Our old friend Ricardo and the iron law of wages. So, so although they were able to, in February, unite to drive out Louis Philippe and bring down Guizot, um, they don't want the same things and it's going to lead to these problems. So in April 1848, the provisional government holds elections, just like Lamartine said. Lamartine is an honorable man. He said there are going to be elections. There are elections. Good job, Lamartine. You're an honorable man. Um, the elections are held, the first elections in France, um, where there's basically universal male suffrage. Every person, every man in France gets a vote, which means basically 9 million people. Um, <coughs> and this results in a sort of center-right majority in the National Assembly. What this reveals is there is a big distinction between 
Paris, the sans culotte of Paris and the rest of France. Uh, France has a very complicated relationship with Paris. Paris is obviously the most famous city, the, the, the most productive city, the, the city that's the center of culture and the economy and government and all that stuff. But it's also deeply resented um, because Parisians put on airs and, 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 the, and, and, and because there's the sense that Paris takes all the good stuff. Um, and, and so the vast majority of people out in the provinces do not vote for the radical socialists. Um, they don't like the idea of, of giving their money to support layabout Parisian sans culotte who don't want to actually work for a living. Um, um, and so, so this new, so there's a, there's a new national assembly um, that is going to supposedly create a new, a new constitution for the state. Um, <coughs> and uh, uh, before they even get to the constitution, what they want is to get rid of Blanc, get rid of the national workshops. Get rid of all this socialism nonsense. Let's put things back on good liberal grounds. So in early June, uh, the national workshops are shut down, and they begin cracking down on guys like Blanc uh, and the socialists. And so the people of Paris, well, you can probably guess what's coming, right? Uh, on May 15th of 1848, they storm in thousands and thousands, maybe as many as 10,000 people attack uh, or at least march into the National Assembly to express their anger. Um, this is so explicitly patterned on the, the, what the San culotte were doing back in the 1790s. So now we have the sons or grandsons of those people now launching themselves in, 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 in some of literally the same footsteps um, as they attack the National Assembly. And you know what's coming, to the barricades again! And this is going to be called the June Day. So we've got the February uh, 1848 uh, uh, revolt. That's when where Louis Philippe goes down. And then we have the June Days, um, still 1848, where the people, uh, the, 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 I don't know if it's fair to call them radical or socialist, but cer certainly the, the working class people of Paris hurling themselves against, against the government, hurling themselves against... Uh, the conservatives in the uh, in the assembly. Uh, oh, by the way, the people are going to lose. Um, this is really where um, French history turns especially tragic, um, because um, the new government, which we're going to see, is called the Second French Republic. The this the National Assembly, despite being assaulted. Um, is going to create a new government, which we're going to call the Second French Republic, the First French Republic being during the, the French Revolution. The Second French Republic um, is, is in the process of being formed, but a general, Louis Cavignac, uh, basically says, screw that, screw the Constitution. He assumes dictatorial powers with the army, and he crushes the revolt. He marches the army, he surrounds Paris, he brings in artillery, and he just blows the crap out of Paris. Ten thousand Parisians die. That is a bloodbath. That is that is a that is a horrific infliction of casualties. Remember, I mean, you know, uh, in a in a in a much larger country, much later time, right? The United States lost three thousand people uh, on nine eleven, and and uh, you know that was a, obviously a traumatic event for us. Ten thousand people killed by our by by France's own army. Um, this is a, a traumatic event, and it is a huge victory for the conservatives. The conservatives win. Uh, the the the, uh, the uppity uh, uh, socialists and, and working class people of Paris are literally crushed. And so we get this, the new symbol of the French Second Republic. Notice how, shall we say, blunt, this image is uh, very different from Marianne, right? From Delacroix's painting of 1830, right? I mean, she's got the tricolor barely. You can see she's got it kind of wrapped around her waist, mostly hidden. Like, yeah, yeah, she's got that. But that's not the point, right? I mean, she's offering you the olive branch with her left hand. Yes, you can have peace. But if you don't accept the olive branch, what's going to happen? The naked sword and the really tough very badass lion. This is a muscular, conservative view of France, 
um, that is not going to put up with any crap from the working class. So, um, uh, November of 1848, they, they, they create a new constitution. Uh, that was their job. Um, and they provide for an elected president and a one-house legislature. And they're doing everything they can to limit the power of Paris. And so there is an election in uh, December of 1848. So we've got February of 1848. We have the, 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 the first revolt that brings down Louis Philippe. Then we have the splitting of the coalition during the spring. Then we have the June days um, that, that um, sh uh, where, where, where the people take the streets, the barricades are shattered. Then we have, in the summer, Cavignac slaughters the people of Paris. <coughs> then in December, we have elections. And Lamartine, who was such a hero just earlier in the year, Lamartine, who was a good guy, who wanted to be a conciliator, who wanted to take care of everybody, Lamartine is crushed. People have no more patience with, with compromise. People have no more patience with, with uh, um, making gestures of conciliation. Lamartine gets something like 20,000 votes in the entire country. Everybody thinks that Cavignac, the butcher of Paris, is going to win the election and become president of Paris, or president of France. But, shockingly, he is defeated. He is defeated by a, 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 a man who uh, uh, of limited uh, public experience, but a man who has the greatest name in French political history. Louis Napoleon. Could you come up with a better name for someone in French politics, right? Combi literally combining the two strands. Um, he was actually a uh, nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte um, and um, had had, a, 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 I mean, not a, a especially um, a, a dignified, dignified is the wrong word, a, a, not a remarkable career up till now, but he runs for president and he gets... Um, Huge, huge support out in the countryside, in the provinces, because people love his name. Because they look back fondly on the days of the empire under Napoleon, or maybe they look back fondly under the, uh, under the monarchy, under Louis. And because Louis Napoleon hasn't actually done anything so far in his life, he can be everything to everybody. Um, he, he has no record to run against, if you will. Um, you know, if you're the... if. if if you're a royalist, he would say things that are vaguely positive about the monarchy. If you're a liberal, he would say vaguely positive things about, about laissez-faire economics. Uh, if you're a member on the countryside, uh, he would say uh, vaguely positive things about uh, uh, French, French glory. Um, but what he runs more than anything else on is order. No more of these French people, no more of these sans culotte uprisings. I am going to impose order. And the vast majority of France finds that very appealing. So, Napoleon takes over as president of Paris, the president of the Second Republic, uh, and he gets to work. He purges the government of all the radical officials, the socialists, the blancs. They all get dumped. Uh, in, they're replaced with these ultra-conservatives and monarchists. Um, uh, he disbands the National Assembly. He holds new elections. Um, uh, he presents himself as a man of the people. Um, uh, his government is supported by the royalists and the conservatives. He regularly uses force uh, against dissenters. Uh, and, and so he's kind of, um, you know, he, he's going along for about four years, um, three, three and a half, four years. Um, and uh, the problem is that, that there's a limit on um, how often he can, he can run. And he tries to get a, the law amended so he can be president for a second term. It looks like that's not going to work. And so... Coup d'état! Um, and he, uh, he shuts down the National Assembly. He declares himself uh, Emperor Louis Napoleon, forming a hereditary Second French Empire and taking a hint from his, his famous, famous uncle. He has a plebiscite, a national vote in which people get to say, do you agree with uh, this or not? And the vote is overwhelmingly in favor. It was probably rigged but it was a good story. And you'll notice the difference, right? Here's Emperor Louis Napoleon, very different from the man of the people. So has anything changed? It's a good question. 
We'll talk about it. Thanks for listening.